All right. Hello, everyone. You should be seeing us now uh, on YouTube as well. I'm hoping that um, you can hear us, you can see us. And uh, I would like to let you know that it would be fantastic if you use the chat function below um, to let us know if yeah, there's any problems or if there's anything not working fantastically well. Um, just give us a heads up and we'll try to resolve it as we go along. This is the first virtual meetup that we do at WebZurich. Um, so everything is slightly new and weird and different, but I think we'll do fine. We tested this a few times, but you know, technology is sometimes a little less predictable than we would like it to be. Um, yeah, so we have a little bit of time left until the talks officially start. Uh, I'll put up the intro slides as well. And um, just make yourself familiar with the YouTube interface. Um, just, you know, say hi in the chat. And uh, yeah, just grab a drink, do your last toilet break, and uh, then we'll be soon commencing with the talks. And uh, yeah, so please, please do let us know in the chat if there's anything that you would like to share. And also because we can't obviously mingle with each other, it's perfectly fine to do a little bit of small talk. Maybe not during the talks, because I think it's a good opportunity for you to actually um, you know, concentrate on the talks, but uh, definitely use the chat to your liking. That's great. So you can all see us and hear us. The first people are already arriving in the chat. Hi, Michael, and hi, Daniel. That is lovely. I'm pretty excited, actually, because this is really weird. I'm, I've done a few virtual events so far, and uh, I still find it odd to not see you all. You can see me, but I can't see you. That's unfair. And um, also, I'll I'll have to deal with the fact that uh, all the feedback will just be <laughs> in the chat, unfortunately. Choppy audio, that's, hmm. Maybe that'll be better in the future. So I hope you are all safe and sound uh, and weathering this weird time at home. And um, maybe we are also having a few viewers who are normally not in the Web Zurich crowd. And we might have anyone anyone in the chat um, from somewhere else than Zurich or Switzerland. Do we have like an international audience tonight? I'm wondering about that. Because that's the upside of all of this. When we do a virtual meetup, at least everyone can join from the comfort of their home. And I hope that you have like a glass of wine, maybe, or like a little cheese platter, as I imagine fancy people have. I should have a cheese platter. Why don't I have a cheese platter? That was bad planning on my end, I think. Macedonia, France. Well. I mean, that, yes, okay, sure. And I know that Vasilika is uh, calling in from Luxembourg, so we have uh, a few international speakers here. But do we have people in the audience who are not speakers also coming from other regions? Well, Macedonia, so that's pretty, pretty amazing, actually. It's pretty cool. I'm always wondering. Cool. So as more people are arriving, as I already said, use the chat, say hi, do a little bit of chit chat with others. Uh, tell us where you're from. You know where we have already 14 people in the in the stream. 80 people signed up for the meetup, and I know that some people then more or less last minute decide to you know the weather was too nice to actually go somewhere else, or I was already at home and I can't be bothered to go elsewhere. So I would hope that uh, we see a bunch of people coming in tonight as well, as they don't have to leave the comfort of their home. Hi, FA or FA. <laughs> more and more people streaming in. Switzerland, where in Switzerland are you based? Just to like get a feeling for where our community tonight lives. More Swiss people coming in. I mean, it's Web Zurich, so I'm not surprised, but uh, super happy to see that you're all here. 
even though the fantastic weather, which probably ends tomorrow, um, probably draws out a bunch of people into the, the Everness. It's either this or clean up the flat. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> here you learn something. This is potentially important for work. So it's very important that you're in this uh, in this web meetup. So mm, yeah. No, I, I understand that. I understand that. Interestingly enough, for me, it's often the other way around where I'm like, yeah, I really should be in this meeting call. And then it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was very busy rearranging things on my desk because it's important. As I now work from home all the time, it's very important. And then, yeah, things don't necessarily get done. How are you all weathering the these strange times i guess you are working from home doing more video calls than usually probably or are you working for a remote company anyways and there's no difference really i i might be you daniel i might be you we've met before and i'm like i recognize a lot of him in me and me and him as mm -hmm. So everyone's home officing. Do you miss the office? Because I kind of do a little bit, but then again, I also get to spend more time uh, with my partner at home, which is amazing. And I actually also get to spend more time cycling, which is also great, especially with the weather recently. Oh, you actually got back to the office today. That's interesting. I think like, I don't know when our offices will reopen and I'm assuming that like a bunch of people need to stay home. But then again, I did read an article that like a bunch of companies apparently are very antsy to get people back into the office. Mm. Balcony, fantastic. Now I'm jealous. I wonder if I can take my external second monitor to the balcony. I don't think I should, especially with the rain coming up this week. I should probably not do that. Oh, really? It's it's just so you're you're back in the office today for like all the whiteboarding and all that kind of stuff, and then you're going back to home office for how long? You work on a potato. As in the computer that you work on in the office, or I do miss I do miss hanging out with my coworkers. Do you all do like virtual coffee breaks? Because we just introduced that uh, to just like have a non-work kind of chat once a day if you want to. You don't have to join those, but if you want to, like the team gets together and just has like a a non-work fun chat that has nothing really like substantial in it. We do have a lot of fun together, which is nice. Yeah, what kind of, yeah, see, other people are wondering what's up with the potato. Tell us more. Oops, okay, I noticed that when I switch windows on one screen, the other screen also attempts to switch windows. That's interesting. <clears throat> One day and then back to home office. That's interesting. I mean, I, I understand that whiteboarding is a really, really great way to like sketch out some ideas. And I haven't seen a good virtual whiteboard solution or anything like that. So I do get where that's coming from. But like for literally just bringing people back for one day and then going back. Interesting. Hmm. Strange. But I think I think that's I, th I think. Hey, hi, Martin. Your German accent comes back. That's lovely. Miro. Never heard that one. But then again, I have honestly, I just gave up on 
on virtual whiteboarding solutions. Why is why are both screens flickering when they when I change a thing? I don't know. Whatever. Miro, that sounds interesting. I know that um, there's also this Jamboard thing, but I'm not sure if that's like fully virtual because you definitely have hardware associated with it. So. And also, are you doing things that you normally don't have time for? Like, I, I just, I don't know. I just decided and I have no reasonable reason for this. I just decided to like get back into uh, FPGA and, and VHDL and stuff. And I noticed that I basically forgot 95% of my VHDL, but I got a little evaluation board. So I'm tinkering with hardware now. Not that I will do anything useful or reasonable with this, but it's like it's a nice distraction. And also video games, to be honest, uh, are a big part of of that stuff now. Oh, Daniel, you have like one of these. I remember working for a Swiss financial institution that shall go unnamed to protect the innocent and not so innocent. Uh, they gave me a fantastic laptop that was very useful as a paperweight as well. Right. I'm just sneaked in and wanted to say hello to everyone. This is Alexei, our lovely host for tonight. <laughs> hello, hello. So, we how are we doing? People. You look, yeah. People are waiting. Oh, Jesse over there. Yes, our speakers are getting ready. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, I think with Jesse. it being like. 14 minutes. Should we start the intro presentation? Yeah, we can. Okay, let's start the intro presentation. Manager laptops. Yeah, no, don't. No, no, no. Don't let them trick you. Okay, time to go over the housekeeping. Roughly the same for those of you who have been to Web Zurich events beforehand, you know the drill. For those of you who are new, Highly recommend writing that into the chat down there um, because that is your place to actually potentially meet someone to talk to after the events as well. And hopefully eventually we'll get back to real in-person events. But as long as we can, we'll use the opportunity to get speakers from abroad as well, uh, which is a little harder to do normally, but a little easier or a lot easier actually, uh, as long as we do online events. So. Uh, Seven sharp, we will start with the first talk from uh, Jesse Martin on Graph CMS. Um, these events are fundamentally every month. So we are running one meetup every month. Um, we are having a uh, Twitter hashtag, WebZurich. Uh, if you want to like talk about WebZurich on Twitter or share the word about it and um, find out what's up. Generally speaking, Web Zurich is a community for everyone who works with the web, who makes the web. So we are a group of web designers, user experience experts, web developers, web accessibility professionals, uh, marketing folks, SEO folks, content strategy people, e-commerce uh, providers, as well as developers and, and uh, well, shop providers, I guess. Uh, we also uh, sometimes have talks on uh, extended reality or augmented reality or virtual reality, um, interaction uh, design or, or interaction uh, information architecture is something that we definitely talk about every now and then. And basically, if you are making things on the web, and it doesn't matter to what level, if it's an, as, a, as a hobby or if you're doing this professionally, you are welcome here and you will find like-minded people to share ideas with, to discuss problems with, to just like hang out with and chat every now and then. Um, you can find out more on our website. Uh, you can join the chat community on Slack. And if you want to learn more about these monthly events and uh, like get up to date with, with the monthly events, then you can also join us on meetup.com. We have a meetup group too. So we have a bunch of principles that we follow when we run these events. Um, first things first, everyone's welcome. You don't have to be like doing this for 20 years. You can be just like starting with it. You can just be curious about the web. Uh, you might as well talk about all sorts of things with your peers. That's that's perfectly fine. That's what we do together. 
Uh, but we do also have a code of conduct that's also valid for this online event as well as the chat and everything else. Um, we would like you to just make sure that you are behaving nicely and friendly with each other. And if that's not the case, then please reach out to us. Uh, you can also use the Twitter channel uh, to actually reach out to us and let us know if there's a problem. We'll help you. The goal of all of this is to bring together people who are you know, normally in the same area, but now that we are online pretty much anywhere in the world, uh, share what they're working on, so share your projects, share your ideas, uh, collaborate on things together. People have built stuff together. Uh, there, there are a few people who are like coming up with random ideas and then other people are building these ideas. So like web Zurich driven development is a thing. Um, and to make this as easy as possible, we usually speak English. You can totally speak to your peers in whatever language you want to, but you're definitely getting the most out of this meetup uh, and this, this entire community when you speak English. So even if your English isn't perfect, that's absolutely 100% fine. We'll figure it out. Um, so definitely don't worry. Oh, Johnny, hi. Johnny is one of the people who is in part of the Web Zurich Driven Development Group, and that's, that's hilarious. Like, he built a bunch of stuff just because of a discussion in Web Zurich. It's lovely. Um, and you're you're not just invited to join us as a viewer like today. We're always looking for speakers. Our slots are 15 minutes. They are super short. It doesn't hurt to just like put together a few slides. We are helping you with putting together the slides. And um, if you have learned something, that means that you are ready to share your story. Even if it went all downhill, that's perfectly fine. Uh, because we all learn by making mistakes. So sharing your mistakes is something that is really interesting as well uh, as your successes. So like you can talk about pretty much everything. Propose a talk is also super easy. Uh, you just go to our website and say submit a talk and then fill out a short Google form. And if you need additional help, just reach out to us and we're happy to like get you up and started and do like rehearsals and stuff with you if you want to. We also have a neutral home. We are normally, when we are meeting in like real life, we are meeting in um, in the Impact Hub uh, in the Viaduct uh, in Zurich. But uh, we also try to like not be. We have a bunch of sponsors who are making this possible, but we don't want like sponsored talks or something like that because the idea is to share something that is of interest to to people who do web stuff. Um, we have a fantastic team of people who are making this possible. These are the amazing humans that keep this running. And um, and me, who is every now and then showing up and talking to you all, but that's like pretty much the extent of it. Everything else that you see here is done by the lovely other people. This stream would be impossible without Alexei, for instance. Alexei is running the show here. I'm just the talking head moving on screen right now. Um, most of us are, are here today in the stream. If you have any questions, uh, just like reach out in the chat or find us on the Slack channel. We do run this out of our own pockets mostly. We are now having a little bit of support from the, from the sponsors every now and then, uh, which is nice, that helps us. But if we wanna run the uh, physical events again, then we have to pay for things like drinks and snacks. Uh, we are having a bunch of equipment that we bought, especially to like record these things. And also the streaming setup was not free. Um, so if you want to contribute in any of these areas, let us know for the real world events that we hopefully be able to resume sometime in summer. Uh, in summer, we also, also usually have a community barbecue where we also need sponsors to actually get the food and everything. Um, and then we, we take care entirely of the logistics. If you have a little bit of money and want to give us a little bit of money uh, from your credit card, for instance, or PayPal or something, that is also possible. Please do that uh, through, our, uh, through our Patreon account. Um, that would be very nice to just keep things running. Sweet. Today's sponsors are Rockstar Recruiting and Graph CMS and Valtech. They make this all possible and keep us afloat this month. So we also have uh, workshops. Um, we wanted to run one today in person that obviously did not work. So we had to like postpone that a little bit, but the workshop is still happening. Uh, we will do more workshops in 2021, hopefully again in, in uh, like in-person workshops as well. Um, but the next one would be Smart Responsive Interfa Interface Design Patterns uh, by Vitaly Friedman from Smashing Magazine. Um, definitely recommend his workshops, they're fantastic. And if you are interested in the topic, definitely get yourself a ticket. Uh, again, check the website for more information. 
Sweet. Our next meetup will be on the 25th of May. So mark your calendars, check out uh, our website regularly, and also meetup.com will have the updated uh, next meetup soon. And uh, we are always looking for speakers, as I said, like just submit your idea um, via the form. And uh, yeah, we would love to see you again, either in the next virtual meetup or hopefully in one of our actual in-person meetups if possible. And uh, yeah, so let's get ready for our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Jesse Martin from Graph CMS, and he'll give us the update on what's happening in Graph CMS, right, Jesse? Microphone on, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Latest with Graph CMS. Um, yeah, tonight we'll be doing a little bit of a, a demo and showing off the latest changes that we have introduced. In the chat on YouTube, I dropped a link because uh, we had mentioned Miro earlier. I dropped a link there if you want to check it out. I am going to be doing live schema building tonight, which means that I need audience participation, which always becomes challenging on a live stream. Uh, so if you want to drop some ideas in there about like a company name. So as an example, the last time I did this, we ended up building a startup that delivered cats and beer via rocket ship. Um, <laughs> so uh, feel free to uh, abuse my mental faculties as much as you want. Uh, go ahead and drop some company ideas in there uh, about what the what does the company do? Is it a delivery service? Is it a restaurant? Uh, Take a few minutes to check it out and drop in some crazy concepts, and we'll build that out live in Graph CMS. Awesome. In which case, I'll hand over to you. Feel free to share your screen. And uh, well, I would say like give a round of applause, but we can't really do that. So <laughs> just imagine the crowd going wild for your talk. Thank you so much for being with us, Jesse. And stay yours. All right. Great. So let's go ahead and try this out here. I'm going to share my window. It's technically like four minutes early, so I'll just kind of kind of sneak in here slowly so people have some time. Ooh, yeah, sorry. I didn't notice that I was finishing up early. No, it's all good. Um, I'll just uh, get the window set up here and get things rolling. Do we have the actual application set up here? Looks like it. Can you, can you see my screen? Looks like it. Cool. Looks like it's it's up and running. Uh, so while that's coming up, we'll give everybody their precious three minutes to arrive. No, no business suggestions yet on that link though. So I'll keep an eye on that. See what see what uh, shows up. You can also just drop the name inside of the uh, YouTube chat too if you want. So feel free to drop any ideas at all. I think um, I'm. I'm most excited about this topic and about your talk today because it's so fantastic. We have been using like Graph CMS now for the, I think for the last two years, our website. And you have now a next edition. And yeah, I, I cannot wait to, to switch actually to the latest version. Yeah, we, I mean, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I'm going to also just maybe put a little caveat out there. So there, we are technically a sponsor. We offer like uh, we just host the website um, for for the amazing community here. So when it comes to me presenting the tool today, I'm wanting to be a little bit uh, careful. This is not supposed to be a straight up vendor talk. I want to talk more about content architecture concepts. I want to be talking a little bit about some GraphQL, why this makes a big difference. Um, we offer really generous free developer licenses, so it's something that we just really want to be a tool for developers to be able to use GraphQL. I mean, if you know anything about it, and I'll explain a little bit about GraphQL a little bit later on, you've got ultimate data portability, so even if you decided you wanted to take your data and run, like, it's yours. <laughs> so um, I, it's a tool that I hope, hopefully you'll be able to get some, uh, see how to get started with GraphQL quickly and be able to explore that amazing technology. And uh, the headless CMS paradigm is one that's gonna be continuing to grow. So hopefully you'll be able to learn some stuff about it. So still looking for some, some app ideas. Looks like we're still 
nobody nobody's got any ideas yet. Otherwise, it's going to be like a beer catalog again because it's like my very unoriginal fallback. But can you can you post the link again into the YouTube chat? Yeah. I did try to open it up uh, to like, it's like, please be, please be nice in there because it's like not uh, monitored <laughs> and, and it's full right access to anybody with a link. Let me try writing something with the link. Maybe there's like some kind of an abuse thing catching it. Um, here's the link for the whiteboard. Just in case it happens to be catching it. But so, and if the whiteboard link's not working and you actually have an idea you want to drop, you can also just uh, online lottery. Interesting. I don't know. I actually have very little experience with online gaming, <laughs> but that might be an interesting one to explore. So, uh, FA, you're going to have to be. Uh, sticking around for some some further questions all later on. So we're at we're at uh, seven o'clock. I guess that means it's go time. Got the green lights. All right. <clears throat> now we got the ideas coming in. All right, cool. Uh, so the high level of a graph CMS is here is it is a headless CMS. Uh, for those that are not familiar with it, the general idea is that it is a bucket for all your content online. So the traditional CMS, you had a, a stack that you would be building. So maybe, let's say WordPress or um, any of the other famous CMS examples, they would tell you which templating language to use. They would tell you all those kind of details. With a headless CMS, all it is is just a database that stores your content. You have the interface to be able to edit that content, but then you access that data via API and you can put it in, and pull it wherever you want to. So as long as you have a web request available, you can target an Alexa skill, you could put it on a refrigerator, you could uh, pull it into any number of phone apps or, or desktop apps, whatever you'd want to do. So it's, it's a really powerful paradigm. It frees the developers to be as fast and efficient as they want to be using the technologies that they're comfortable with but at the same time giving a nicer editing interface for the marketing team in the back end to work with. Um, so it's, it, this concept is called headless because there's no front end technology, there's no head on it. And it's just a, it's a paradigm we're bullish on and think that's the future of building products for the web. You can see uh, amazing companies using headless CMSs, for example. <laughs> so uh, the, the Web Zurich homepage is actually built on Graph CMS. I believe they're using Vue for the, for the front end framework. Doesn't matter what you want to use, you can use any technology you want uh, and pull from a content hub. So, yeah, headless CMSs are what I really believe are the future. Our product in particular is all in on a technology called GraphQL. GraphQL is a tech, is a well, it's three things. It's essentially, it's a, um, the one that's most visible for is a query language. And it's a really descriptive way to query data you want. We'll look at that a little bit later on. It is an execution engine that actually takes this query and will resolve that data in the, the least amount of payload possible to send back to the client. And it is a, um, it's essentially um, a specification of what the, what GraphQL looks like. So anything that that produces a GraphQL compliant uh, API will support a couple of uh, true values, such as that you can introspect the API. And introspection means that any tool out there that is a GraphQL tool hits your API and is able to actually see the entire content architecture behind it. When you're talking about a, a content modeling or content management system, that introspection becomes super powerful because no matter what it is you want to build, you can convey that schema to any end system. Uh, this, this is the website. We just relaunched this. We're pretty proud of it. A lot of really amazing developers went into working on this. You can take a look at it and, and explore around. What we're going to look at tonight is the actual application. And this is the, the rough dashboard here. And we're going to just do some, some speed, uh, speed schema building. 
So I'm going to go ahead and pop open on a new project. And if my mouse gets really jumpy, just let me know and I'll try to calm down a little bit. Sometimes live streaming mouse is not always the test. So I got to look at the chat here, see what we've got. So I think we were going to go with the online lottery. So we're going to do the, uh, the Zurich online lottery. And we're going to pop this in the Frankfurt um, region because we have a little bit of a faster read time today. So what kind of, what's this lottery doing? What's, what's the chance to win something or what's the possibility here? So a lottery is basically the idea that you submit uh, a ticket and then you can be chosen at random and, and win something, correct? FA, multi-user ability, live drawing online. Okay, so we require lobby for the lotteries. Okay, interesting. So in this case, this will be an, a good example of where a headless CMS comes into play. So we're talking about multi-user accounts. We're talking about the idea of introducing some sort of a lobby room and authenticated space. So Graph CMS doesn't do uh, like user roles on content and trying to find a CMS that would support all of those features, you're looking at an extremely expensive all-in solution that you really have to buy the entire stack. And so what you need, what you can do though with the head of CMS is you can say, well, I can take user auth from this service over here and I can use community management from this service over here and I can take my content management from Graph CMS over here and mesh those together with best of breed technology, the things that you're comfortable working with and actually build the experience that you'd want to build. So we'll go ahead and build out the model in this case of the, the items you could win. So the, the actual items that could be potentially won and then we'll do ticket submissions in this case. Structuring, so structuring of the user accounts, lobby generation. Oh, FA, you're really giving me a challenge here, pushing the boundaries. All right. <laughs> so let's see what we can do here. I'm going to go ahead and grab a free trial on our on our higher account. The dev one wouldn't be, um, be fine. So I'm going to make an assumption here on what you're describing, FA, um, is that the lobby is going to need to be some kind of an online room where people will be meeting. Is this correct? I'm watching. I'm watching the bubbles. So it's like a room, a room where people are meeting, and then there's going to be users that can be attached to that room. If this, I think this is correct. All right. So I'm going to pretend that we have the user auth in Graph CMS. So we'll model the person in this case, and we'll model the room, and and show how to create and connect those for the for the project. So in this case. We're going to go ahead and start off with, uh, I'm speeding up, sorry. So here we have the interface. On the left-hand side, we have the schema generation. The schema is basically a collection of types put together, connected through uh, references and relationships that allow us to actually build this graph-like structure that we're, we're used to uh, in the GraphQL space. So I go to my schema builder. I go to models. We need to start with a lobby. And I'm just going to go ahead and build out my rough types at the beginning. Typically, when I start a new schema project, I'll start with either pen and paper or something like that Miro tool. Because when you're talking about building out your content architecture, as it becomes more mature and more filled out, you're going to realize there were some assumptions you made that were incorrect. And so it's always best to start with a very rough form, sketch it out, connect the dots, figure out how these pieces fit together. And then you'll be able to actually build it in the tool later on. Graph CMS is pretty comfortable for um, being able to, it's, it's comfortable because it lets you edit that schema really quickly, but it's still best practice to start with something a lot more uh, fluid when you begin. I'm getting a message that the resolution's a little bit hard to see. So I'm going to try and shrink this down a little bit, see if this is better. Is that, is that workable? Yeah, it's great. Better? All right, cool. 
So I have my uh, lobby. I have another model here, which is going to be the um, it's going to be a person in this case, which will be reused multiple time, multiple times. And we're going to go ahead and say uh, that there's going to be a ticket for the for the giveaway. And there's going to be a prize. All right. So what we have here, we're going to start with the lobby. We're going to give it a quick uh, name here. And we're going to go ahead and use this as a title field. And I'm going to go ahead and just say, uh, this is going to be a required field. Go ahead and create that. The reason why I said it is a title field is that in the editor, and we'll see this later on, in the editor, when we attach things together, it'll automatically grab the GUID as the identifier, which becomes a little bit messy for a content editor to go see. It's like, oh, can you go to room F172653419, uh, this big GUID? No, it's, they can look for the actual label that you wanted to give it something custom. I'm going to say that the lobby is going to have uh, people that are going to be, so there's going to be participants. So we'll go ahead and call this participants. And we'll say uh, this is going to be a reference to the person model. So I'm naming the edge in this case between my two nodes as participants. I'm giving a semantic value to the relationship. And I'm going to go ahead and say allow multiple values in this case. I'm going to configure the reverse side of that relationship and say that uh, a, a participant could also be in multiple lobbies because potentially they're going to be, and that might be a false assumption. It could be that we enforce that in the lobby itself, uh, like an action. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to, I'm going to add this restriction. So the lobby is a digital waiting room where people have to be able to be present to claim their prize. So in this case, we're going to say um, that the person can only be in one lobby at a time. All right, so let's go ahead and say create. And so I'm just going to stick that there. I'm going to go ahead and add the, the prize in this case as well. So we're going to say that the uh, lobby has a prize. They'd probably be even smarter to break this out as a top level contest. And there's a lobby for the contest. And then I'd be attaching these, these items of data to the, to the actual contest itself. But we're going to go ahead and keep the schema a little bit simple for, for this case. That may come back to haunt me later. This is why I always start with pen and paper. And uh, we're going to go ahead and say that I need a reference to the uh, prize. And that's going to be a reference to the actual prize in this case. No fancy naming on the edge there. And I'm going to say that there's going to be one prize available uh, in the lobby in this case. And there may be, in this case, we'll just abstract the idea of the prize that could be potentially the same prize model used in multiple lobbies. We'll go ahead and allow this one to be a multiple in this case. You can imagine this being, you know, a GA card for a year or something from the SBB, and it's a model that you're then going to be fulfilling later on. We could build out a whole pin model here and say there's actually a certain amount of GA cards available. There's a certain amount of, you know, Swiss chocolate bars available that are part of these prizes and have the individual tracking IDs on those. In this case, we're going to be using more of a, of a model abstraction for the prize the person is winning. So the lobby has the name of the, of the place. It has the participants. I'm going to add another relationship here, which is going to be the um, administrator. I'm going to reference people again. So I'm using the same model, but I'm again giving it a semantic value to the actual um, to the actual value here, uh, to the to the edge. I'm going to go ahead and say that there can be multiple admins in the room, and I'm going to say uh, this is oops, as admin. Otherwise, you get a name collision. So as admin and I'm going to say also allow multiple values so an admin can hop around between lobbies.
If, if you're a stickler for proper naming of the schema, you probably would have liked me to call that lobbies as admin, but we'll we'll live with this for now. All right, so we have the rough idea of the lobby. Uh, we have, I'm gonna go ahead and say that the, the participants themselves will be owners of tickets, so I'm not gonna attach the ticket to the room here. Uh, I'm gonna hop over to the person. We're gonna go ahead and give the person a name. And I'm gonna also give them the ability to have a ticket. So I can already tell here where I should have started with pen and paper because in this idea now, if I look at, if I think about the concept model here, uh, a person could be holding multiple tickets and those tickets would then be redeemable in a specific lobby. So this is already a mistake in my schema, but we're gonna have to run with it. So in this case, a person has one ticket and that's gonna be, that's redeemable in one lobby. So we're gonna go ahead and match this to the ticket. And so in this case, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's not gonna be a many-to-one. And there's gonna be the person. So one ticket, one person. Prize, all right, so now on the prize side, we'll just give this something pretty simple. We'll give it a name in this case. It doesn't have to be very complex here. Oops, let's go ahead and add that again. What could be interesting here to show off a, a feature that we have is, so you can win one of two things. You can win either So I'm going to show off a new feature of, Gra of uh, the new Graph CMS here. It's, a, it's more spec compliant with GraphQL. GraphQL allows for polymorphic relations through a feature called union types. And we now have that available. I'm getting a notice here that I got a little bit of time issues. So I'm going to do this real fast. Uh, so we're going to do uh, one model is a beer. So you can win a beer. All right, pop, pop, pop. I'm going to speed up the models bar here. This is the two. This is turning your YouTube video to 2x here. Uh, the other thing you can possibly win is a chocolate bar. All right, and we're going to go ahead and give that a quick name, just to demonstrate that the there's a difference between the two. Is that I'm going to add an additional value on the chocolate bar. In this case, it's going to be a float to represent the percentage of cocoa. I think that's correct and not cocaine, but we'll just run with it for now. All right, moving a little quick here. So if I go back to the prize and I want to model this out, I'm going to say that the prize is one of, allow this to be a union type, which is our the thing we're really excited about because it opens up a lot of content modeling possibilities. And it can be either a beer or it can be a chocolate bar which is if you've done any kind of content modeling in the past, this is amazing. All right, so we have that created, the ticket very fast. We're just gonna go ahead and give this an integer. Um, in this case, actually, I'm even gonna leave that out because the person has a ticket and I can, mod I can catch this out. So in this case, I'm just having a ticket. When a ticket is created, it has the GUID, that'll be the identifier for the ticket and the person that's holding it is easy to track. I feel a cough coming on. You won't catch corona from this. Let's see if I can catch it. <clears throat> All right, so over to content editing. We will start with a lobby. This is the HB giveaway. Here it comes. I hope you appreciated the very formal uh, elbow action there. Giveaway. All right, we're gonna ask the participants. All right, so Martin is gonna be in this in this giveaway today, of course. And we're gonna go ahead and say two minutes. Okay, so Martin, save and publish. And on um, the other participant, we'll add one more person here in this case. All right. 
Alexa, your name always gives me panic when I try and spell it. <laughs> there we go. Good. And then I want to go to the uh, prize here. We're going to create and add a new prize. And this is going to be the fantastic, uh, fantastic giveaway. And it's going to be, uh, in this case, uh, a chocolate bar. You'll win, you'll win two things. You're going to win the Swiss chocolate, which is a fantastic, super high cocoa percentage. And we're going to add a beer. This is going to be called Swiss. Oh, what is it? Cough up? Is that how you pronounce it? I think so. We'll run with that. Chop. I think I think that's correct. Uh, yeah. Run with the for now because I'm running out of time and I want to get kicked out. So if I'm if I'm being too abusive with that. So uh, we got that. All right. So we've connected there the uh, the the prize. And I'm going to add uh, one more person here as myself as the admin. And I'm going to go ahead and say save and publish that. Take it. So I think I, I'm going to just make a quick attachment here. So uh, select a person. So in this case, uh, Martin gets the ticket. The last two items to add here. And Alexa gets a ticket. So two tickets created, attached to people. The last thing I'm gonna show and that before I get kicked out here then is that built into the system, if I come now down to the built-in API Explorer, oops, let's go ahead and save that. If I come down into the API Explorer here, something is, somebody just lost a ticket. Okay, so we'll find out who. Uh, if I come down into GraphQL now, I have the ability through the introspection query, I can actually get uh, autocomplete about all the content that I have available. And I can start to explore down the actual nested relationships of what I have. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my admin first. I'm going to grab my participants with their name and their ticket. I want the ID of the ticket. I want to go ahead and grab the uh, prize for the room. And in this case, I want the name of the prize. And because it's the union type, I have to do a special syntax for uh, for talking about uh, multiple types here. So in this case, the prize, one of, on beer, give me the name. And then on the chocolate bar, give me the name and the percentage. Okay, so in this case, very simple. I mean, I can validate the schema, the query, because it's all correct. I have no errors. If I run this, zero. I attached all of that and failed to actually build, <laughs> attach them to the lobby. Uh, run real fast, lobby, 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 create new giveaway. HB. So that was what I was getting the error about was that I had failed to actually attach it. I can add the existing people here because all my data is already there. So Martin Alexa. I think I just turned uh, myself into a participant so I don't get a ticket. Uh, pop that out, pop Alexa back in. All right. And then the prize, like the existing prize that I already have. Very good. Admin, add myself. You can see this part where we're trying to explore the name. We're fixing this part end of week. Um, so that'll be a little bit nicer to, to interact with. Save and publish that. Back over to my API Explorer. Let's test it again. There we go. So we have the nested data. We have everything attached. I can see in a relatively simple and readable query syntax on the left here, I can actually drill down and get multiple nested relationships I can reuse models over and over. I'm a little bit over, but roughly in 20 minutes, I was able to build a schema from a random audience member's suggestion, which was a real <coughs> challenging one, <laughs> but that was fun. Um, 
there's a lot of power there. GraphQL gives you a lot of power. Schema generation gives you a lot of power. Um, and it's something that I think we'd love you guys to test out, play around with. This is the new Graph CMS, uh, free developer accounts. Uh, if you're doing something like, for the community and whatever, let me know. Uh, but yeah, um, that's that. <laughs> Sorry for going over. <laughs> no worries. I would not be so like, I, I wouldn't kick anyone off stage uh, if I'm seeing that you're wrapping up. So thank you very much, Jesse. This is awesome. I remember times where building a backend was not just thinking about what you actually care for, which is your data structures and your data, but also having to deal with like figuring out how to get a server somewhere and actually making sure that these servers keep running. So I think it's a really, really cool time to start uh, web projects in because you can use any of the headless CMSs. Graph CMS being an example, and you can just focus everything that Jesse did was focusing on what kind of data do I have, how is it related to each other, and and basically just building the backend, well the core of the backend just like that from a web interface, which I think is like mind blowing still to me, um, looking back at how I used to do web uh, development or the backend side of web development like I don't know five years ago, ten years ago. Um, so that was really cool. Thank you so much, Jesse, for joining us, and thank you so much for the for the presentation and walking through like such a challenging example as well. Uh, you have one really big fan in the YouTube chat, so that's pretty cool as well. Um, and uh, you know, you all now just like very quickly run, grab something to drink, and very quickly come back because our next talk is I'm in Luke I'm in Luke Kiel. I'm so sorry if I butchered your name because I'm really really bad with names and, oh, and pronunciations. Cool. Um, how do you actually pronounce your name properly? I'm in Luke <laughs> That is our next fantastic speaker. I'm really excited to have him, have him here tonight um, because we are in a weird time where online is changing rapidly. Events have to move to other dates or are now running online where they used to run offline. Uh, and so many more things like you might have special announcements, you might have to temporarily close your business. How do you make sure that you can uh, basically um, convey this information in a structured way? Well, that's what structured data is for. And structured data has recently changed quite a lot to actually allow all these different use cases. And I'm really, really happy to have an expert on the topic on uh, with us tonight and actually this is our next talk, and you'll learn a lot more about structured data. If you have never heard about structured data, definitely Google for it or search for it in the search engine of your choice. Um, and uh, yeah, just enjoy the next 15, 20 minutes and uh, just, you know, glue yourself to the screen for the next of our talks. Thank you so much, Ayman, for being here with us. And the uh, stage you. is yours. Thank you. So I'm sharing my screen. Uh, is it OK for you? Seems to be fine, yes. Yeah, cool. So hello, everyone, and I hope that you are fine and safe. Um, as Martin said, we are going to talk about uh, the help that structured data could uh, give to the current situation uh, to help the contents be findable. So I'm Ayman Lukil, international SEO consultant. Uh, I help companies and brands uh, become more visible online on search engines mainly. And um, you can follow me on my Twitter, Lukil Ayman, or on my website, aymanlukil.com. Um, I was asking myself how many content talking about coronavirus uh, are indexed in search engines. So I made a little comment on Google. So I look it for the documents, for the contents that have coronavirus or COVID-19 in the title tag. And that's hilarious because there are more than 1 billion pages only in English language talking about corona. So this is a huge amount of content over here. And um, the number of COVID-19 uh, related contents uh, peaked and surged a lot. So um, this keeps the door open to some noise because data volume leads to noise. So we could um, face 
some misleading contents or fake news or uh, some kind of this. Um, and it's a real challenge to filter out this misleading content and have the right and the good uh, quality of content, the good info at the good time. So search engines have a real challenge understanding urgent COVID-19 information, but also making them findable. Um, and this is where structured data uh, comes to the to rescue, uh, transforming this mess of data from texts, images, videos, and audio to some well-organized um, and well-structured uh, kind of data that, that is machine-readable and useful for the users. So, um, this is the, the new schema.org um, data type that uh, was created and introduced to, to, solve, to try to solve this problem and give away to the webmasters and site owners um, to, to, to tag and to mark up content as a special announcement related to COVID-19. Um, so it's mainly for urgent uh, practical information regarding the situation, such as shelter in place, uh, some schools and public transport closures, etc. So you could check the specifications on schema.org website. Um, so this type have some required and recommended uh, properties, such as the announcement location, uh, the category of the announcement, the date, the date of uh, the announcement, but also at uh, what date it will expire, if appropriate, and some other information such as disease prevention info, disease spread statistics, and how to uh, to get tested, etc. So, if you have questions, don't uh, don't hesitate to to put me questions on the chat. I'm trying to, to read them because I don't have uh, my second uh, screen. <laughs> so um, Google is using this new type to enrich some results with uh, coronavirus information. So this is a screenshot from the Google documentation showing uh, the query coronavirus in California. And as you see, we have this rich snippet showing uh, the recent news about the coronavirus in California state. So uh, we see uh, that there is a shelter in place. Uh, two days ago, there is a new information regarding the worker benefits uh, program uh, and so on. So this is so useful to help users find the right information um, about the situation. For his part, Bing is using special announcement schema data type uh, for enriching and uh, consolidating the data on its COVID-19 tracker. So he's, for example, suggesting some news related to uh, the corona situation in Japan. Uh, as you see, some news with uh, some graphics. And this is so useful to have at a glance uh, information about the situation. So, what are the different types of special announcements that websites could uh, implement? Uh, so, the first one is shelter-in-place directive. Uh, we could also make an announcement about the quarantine guidelines, testing centers, and uh, where to find them, uh, some travel bans and guidelines, public transport closures, uh, also disease spread statistics, as we said for the Bing case, and why not some government benefits programs, such as an unemployment support, bed leave, etc. And of course, the announcements regarding the closure of some businesses or some schools, um, etc. So, um, government websites are the main eligible uh, uh, website for this special announcement type. 
such as government, county official website, but also national health agencies, schools, hospitals, police, and testing centers. But also any website who is eligible for these announcements, maybe uh, for business, some business types, some travel agencies talking about the new travel bans uh, and health providers such as pharmacy and so on. And um, someone asked it on Twitter about who is eligible for this new type. And Danny Sullivan, who is a Googler, uh, confirmed that any website may use this type. So any website could implement the special announcement type uh, since it's really related to an announcement for coronavirus. So, um, how to implement this new type? The first step is to generate the JSON LD markup. Then we should validate it to catch some errors or warnings. And of course, publish it on your web contents. So you could uh, take a look at the given examples on the Google documentation. I put the links here to, to check them. So this is an example of a special announcement type um, talking about the shelter in place for three California counties. So here we are giving the name of the announcement, the text or a summary of the, of the announcement, uh, the date posted and the date uh, of expire, and uh, a link to a page talking about the quarantine guidelines, disease prevention info. So this is so useful for search engines to provide the information for the users. Um, and uh, we are also precising on which special, special coverage this announcement is uh, relevant. Uh, I also developed a tool to generate JSON LD uh, special announcement markup. So we could check it together. Okay, it's loading. <laughs> So uh, this tool could help you uh, generate the JSON LD markup. So uh, let's try to create one. Here's the, the text and description. Of course, we should give the date of the announcement and when it will expire. So here you can give a link to um, the quarantine guideline. The disease prevention info. For the moment, the unique value for the category uh, attribute is this Wikidata uh, topic of coronavirus. And we could simply add a special coverage to say it's only um, related to New York, for example. Um, in some cases, if you have an announcement regarding government benefits, we could mark up it. Uh, and if our announcement is only related to one place, for example, one uh, hospital or one police or one school, uh, we should uh, mark use civic structure or local business to give uh, the exact information about this establishment. So um, the second step is to validate this with the rich results test tool of Google to see if we have some errors or warnings. So it's okay. The tool say, uh, says that our markup is valid. Of course, it's just an example. And it suggests to, to add a name and the URL for the announcement location. Uh, so this is the official tool of uh, Google to, to validate any, any JSON uh, LD markup. 
And of course, the last step is about to implement it. So I put uh, the schema.org specifications uh, documentation link, Bing uh, one and Google ones. Uh, so you, you, you check the documentation and questions about uh, a special you could ask me, uh, you are welcome. Thank you, everyone. And if you have questions, uh, I'm going to check the chat. Um, just ask your questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I think, like, structured data is and uh, if you do, then you are eligible to show up as as a markup your recipe or your articles or your stories. And 